Before I get into this video, I want to give a disclaimer. This video deals with heavy and sensitive topics, some of which include disordered eating, abuse, mental health, deeply religious societies, religious practices, self-harm, and a few more. I understand if this video is not for you, and I hope that you find something that brings you joy. Let's get into the video. In modern times, we know that most, if not all, eating disorders are about control or lack thereof. They're also competitive in nature and thrive within insular and impenetrable communities. Modern day icons like Blair Waldorf developed bulimia as a way to exercise power and autonomy in a strictly controlled society that is meticulously based on looks and status. In this video, study the evolution of bulimia and how young girls from the dawn of time have been using food or the lack thereof to gain influence over a misogynistic and deeply sexist society heavily influenced by God and religion. When I sat down to talk about Blair's struggles with her eating disorder and other issues throughout the show, my mind started to wonder how I could talk about the subject in a way that was more expansive than just discussing the infamous Thanksgiving episode, Blair Waldorf Must Pie. I really wanted to get to the root of the fat phobia and disordered eating in Gossip Girl, and more specifically how it ties into class, race, and gender. You know me, always gotta give a lecture. But the more I sat here and thought about all the ideas and concepts I had swirling in my head that I wanted to somehow connect, my brain started to look like the wall of a Mike's mic video. If I give someone a jumper with a heart pendant on it, it is game fucking over. It wasn't until my rewatch that I stumbled upon the episode where Blair and Chuck are ran off the road. For those of you who aren't familiar with the show, I'll give you a quick synopsis of the episode and specific scene. Although I do suggest you watch it and then come back and watch this to understand it better. Also, you know, give it a thumbs up, boost the algorithm. Okay, anyways. To set the stage, Blair, pregnant with Prince Louis's illegitimate child and her ex-boyfriend Chuck, have just been reunited and are speeding off into the sunset when their car is ran off the road by paparazzi. After immediately being rushed to the hospital, Blair is informed that Chuck is in critical condition and might not survive the injuries he has sustained. It's from there, Blair decides to go to the chapel and make a deal with God. On bended knee, Blair pledges that if God spares Chuck's life and lets him live, Blair will do the right thing. That thing in question being to walk away from Chuck for good and marry Louis, fulfilling her vow as promised. Watching this scene was like a caveman inventing fire for the first time. I didn't really know what to do with it in the moment, but I immediately knew it was significant to the video. It was later on in my research about the history of disordered eating among young women and teen girls that a light bulb hit me. Wait, that's not the same. <laughs> I'm sure you're thinking, why did this specific scene stick out to you? And I'll admit, it was because I was stunned watching Blair immediately turn to God and self-sacrifice as a way to gain control over her current situation. She didn't stop and think for a second about bargaining a lifetime of suffering for the life of someone she loved. And it was the promptness in which she struck the bargain that knocked the wind out of me. In that moment, Blair had flashed a brief glimpse at the unofficial rule book of the young feminine mind, which taught that bartering your pain to powerful men was a surefire way to achieve what you wanted. But then, I started to ponder, with everything we know about disordered eating, aka how it presents, manifests, and develops, foggy links between religion, misogyny, suffering for power and autonomy started to materialize like bright chains around the base of a gendered ankle. Because, you see, Blair is not the first woman in history to wage war against her body and soul for a chance to decide her own fate, or those of the ones she loves. Before we get into more of the history behind disordered eating and how it ties into our society and gender binary, I wanted to define bulimia for you so that you have a base to work off of. So what exactly is bulimia nervosa? Well, defined by the Cleveland Clinic, bulimia nervosa, more commonly called bulimia, is an eating disorder. And eating disorders are mental health conditions that can be potentially life-threatening. It goes on to say, bulimia nervosa can be defined as a pattern of eating characterized by number one, 
consuming an unusually large amount of food in a short period of time, known as binge eating. Number two, getting rid of the food known as purging. Purging may involve making yourself throw up or taking laxatives. And laxatives are medication that speed up the movement of food through your body. Some other characteristics of bulimia nervosa may include the misuse of water pills, known as diuretics or diet pills, eating very little or not at all, known as fasting, excessively exercising, or hiding food to binge and purge later. While the exact cause of bulimia is unknown, most medical professionals agree it's a combination of factors including genetics, learned behaviors, stress, and external pressures. Bulimia, as we know it, however, is relatively new. As for a long time, bulimia was considered a long-term symptom of anorexia. The term bulimia finds its origins in ancient Greece, where the Greeks combined bo, meaning ox, and limos, meaning hunger, to describe the concept of insatiable hunger. Both Hippocrates and Galen, esteemed Greek physicians, studied and defined this disorder recognizing its reoccurring patterns of binge eating and purging. Bulimia would come to be studied for hundreds of years, with physicians from each era passing along pieces of information and understanding like a game of generational telephone. But in the name of brevity and cultural relevance, we're going to jump ahead for a bit and talk about the 90s. As not only was bulimia officially added to the DSM in 1994, but it's also when a remarkable and rightly beloved figure brought bulimia into the spotlight, making it the subject of public discourse and awareness. That person was none other than Diana Spencer, known to the world as Princess Diana. In her 1992 biography, Diana, her true story in her own words, she spoke candidly about her lifelong mental health struggles and her battle with bulimia. The book had been written with the help of author slash friend Andrew Morton and featured transcribed accounts from secret recordings Diana made while living inside the palace. Virtually mimicking Blair's story arc, Diana cites her transition from teacher to princess as the catalyst for her bulimia. For all her aristocratic breeding, this innocent young kindergarten teacher felt totally at sea in the deferential hierarchy of Buckingham Palace. There were many tears in those three months and many more to come after that weight simply dropped off her. Her waist shrinking from 29 inches when the engagement was announced down to 23 inches on her wedding day. It was during this turbulent time that her bulimia nervosa, which would take nearly a decade to overcome, began, Morton writes of Diana. And if her ascent to royalty wasn't enough to keep her submerged within the dark recesses of struggle and suffering, her husband, the current King of England, sure was. As in her novel, Diana goes on to detail an alleged comment made to her by the then Prince Charles shortly after the two had wed. My husband put his hand on my waistline and said, oh, a bit chubby here, aren't we? And that triggered something off in me and the Camilla thing. The Camilla thing being the not so secret affair between Charles and Camilla Shand the current queen consort of England. The prince's adoration for Camilla was well documented in the British press and openly flaunted by Charles, who is said to have worn cufflinks given to him by Camilla for the duration of his honeymoon with Diana. But it isn't until 1995 when Diana, who now single after a very messy public separation from Charles, sits down with the BBC for one of the most scandalous interviews to date. Very much so. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Holding almost nothing back, the interview flows through every rocky section of Diana's life, zeroing in on her union with Charles and the damage she sustained while in it, specifically naming what was going on in her marriage as the reason for the preservation of her bulimia and the cycle she was trapped in. I didn't like myself. I was ashamed because I couldn't cope with the pressures. I had bulimia for a number of years and that's like a secret disease. It's a repetitive pattern which is very destructive to yourself. Her openness and honesty about her struggles with bulimia shed light on the prevalence of eating disorders, especially amongst young women. 
and her courage sparked a movement that encouraged understanding and empathy for those fighting this often invisible battle. And it's Blair's story, so reminiscent of Princess Diana's experiences, that had me looking for clues in the murkiness of their candor. I had established that power dynamics and gilded cages could lead one down a path of situational induced suffering, but it wasn't until I came across a book titled Who Cooked the Last Supper? The Women's History of the World by Rosalind Miles that I found one of the missing pieces to the picture. You see, Who Cooked the Last Supper, or Last Supper for short, is a ripper of a book that refuses to let its reader look away from the reality of what has been done to women throughout history. And, as a female-identifying cis woman, I wanted nothing more than to close my eyes while reading. But it's the book's main point that made sense of so much that had been hidden to me, so much that I couldn't desert it. Last Supper details this transition from the worshipping of mother goddesses and fertility to the fall of matriarchal societies as it pertains to pregnancy. More specifically, the discovery that pregnancy is not something divine that happens to women, but it is in fact something that can be done to women. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> the fact that men, discovering they were necessary for procreation in the same way a woman was, only establishing and enforcing the gender binary instead of equaling it, is common knowledge, considering it's the society we live in. But the idea that pregnancy was weaponized for control was something I stupidly hadn't thought of, at least in this context. Because surely if pregnancy was a weapon, a sort of slow killing poison to a matriarchal society, then there must be an antidote. Who cooked the Last Supper proved there was. The book documents the survival and strength of women throughout history as they subvert and rebuke the oppression their unwanted suitors force upon them. But I was still perplexed how it could be possible in the stories in which there was no overt violence or rebellion. Then it clicked. Because in a patriarchal, cisgendered society, in order to become pregnant, one must menstruate. I mean, if you could figure out a way to stop that, it might not stop the violence, but it could snuff out a lineage, proves an unsuitable quality for marriage, makes one easy to discard, most importantly, easy to ignore which is the best one could hope for. That's when I remembered bulimia's false categorization as a symptom of anorexia. How were the two linked and when did they make the discovery? I thought of the symptoms, I racked my brain, and then I remembered Blair's punishment, Blair's self-subjugation. And then I thought, would one starve in exchange for losing their period? Their silent suffering as a way of rebellion? The bartering of pain for desired outcomes? The moment that autonomy becomes ability? Because if pregnancy was no longer something mysterious, if it was something we all knew and understand and it was the right of a man to decide, surely the absence of pregnancy was divine intervention, right? I mean, in a society based on the will of a father god, it's as safe a bet to make as any. And with the beginning of menstruation marking a young girl's journey, be it by force or design, into womanhood, I had to know. I wanted to explore these historical connections and gain insight into how it all relates, how it relates to the quest for independence. How did we figure this out? When did we learn this? Did we ever learn it? Was it something inherent inside of us? I knew it had to be more. Because maybe it was inherent, but maybe it was inherited. So if a society is a patriarchy, where men have the final say, how do you get them to listen when you're, let's say, a young teenage girl, one who is petrified at the idea of being married off and forced to live a life she does not want? The answer is actually simple. Go above their heads, to their fathers, the only men they are taught to submit to. And I don't mean their biological one. I'm talking about the Heavenly Father. More so I wondered, how do you get their attention? Even more so, how do you focus their attention on the fact that you have God's attention? Acting out might lead to violence. Anything you do too odd could have bigger societal repercussions. 
especially in a pious society heavily reliant on moral compliance. But if every time your mother offered you food at the dinner table, your response was, I'm not hungry. Or if you didn't complain of hunger pains and eventually have a full meal. If you could say, go months and months with hardly any food and simple amounts of water, yet still live. Surely God had blessed you with divinity and being the messenger from Christ himself is one way to have your will enacted. Yes, the idea that starving young girls could survive off literally the body of Christ, some sort of emotional manna from heaven, was so prevalent that it actually has a name. Anorexia mirabilis, also known as holy anorexia. used to describe a historical phenomenon where individuals, particularly female saints and religious ascetics, were believed to be able to survive without consuming regular food or water, relying solely on their faith and spiritual practices for sustenance. It was perceived as a miraculous and divine gift, and those who were thought to possess the ability were often regarded as being especially close to God or spiritually enlightened. And it's not that rare. I mean, accounts of anorexia mirabilis date back to medieval times and have been documented in the lives of various Christian and Catholic saints. These individuals were often seen as embodying extreme piety and self-denial, transcending the physical needs of the body in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. And what better way to become off limits than by being divine? Couple that with the fact that modern studies show that 68 to 89 percent of anorexia patients report losing their period for at least three months during the peak of their illness, a condition actually known as amenorrhea, you set a dangerous standard. Because a young girl who can sustain on nothing but water and prayers is one thing, but one who has never had her first blood Well, that can be a significant amount of power to wield. So much so that you could even convince the Pope to do your bidding. Enter a young girl from the middle of Tuscany, Katharina, or as we'll get to know her later on, St. Catherine of Siena. Catherine's story starts well before any young woman should, at six years old, when, walking home with her brother from a church service, she's struck by a vision in the sky. Appearing before the small child is Jesus Christ upon his heavenly throne, flanked by three apostles. The story goes that Jesus ever so slightly reached down and blessed the young Catherine, and upon receiving said gift, Catherine made a pledge to remain a virgin for the rest of her life. Odd, right? Well, not really, if you look a little deeper into the story. Catherine's pledge was more or less ignored by her parents, who weren't entirely happy with their daughter's unforeseen bargain. At 13, her parents decided to arrange to have her wed, and for the next three years, Catherine would spend her time dodging and avoiding every eligible suitor that came to her house to court her. And her behavior went largely unchecked. It was when she turned 16 that her true troubles began. Catherine's older sister, Bonaventura, unfortunately dies giving birth to a child, and being somewhat of a second mother to her younger sister, Catherine is absolutely devastated. But to make matters worse, her parents arrange for Catherine to marry her sister's widowed husband. Gross, right? But don't worry. They don't end up married. In fact, it's her late sister's advice that helps her successfully evade marriage entirely. See, allegedly... Bonaventura's husband was ill-mannered, brutish, stubborn, unwilling to listen to his new wife, who was insistent that he change his ways. So, in order to enforce compliance, Bonaventura started fasting until her husband agreed to behave and change his ways. And story goes, she told Catherine this sagely, directing her to tuck the strategy away should she ever need to use it. And... The moment her parents proposed the arrangement, Catherine announced a strict fast, refusing food or water, and moving to a quiet room under the stairs in her family home. That wasn't it, though. She then took a sword to her beautiful long hair and gave herself what can only be described as 
a basement shop pixie cut, much to her mother's dismay. When she asked why she did it, her answer was simple. To make myself less attractive to any potential husband, she replied. There I have it. A direct correlation between disordered eating and self-mutilation for the sake of self-government. But that idea wasn't new. In fact, it's called aestheticism. More on that later. But more importantly, what did it have to do with Blair? The answer was, while not yet fully developed, easy to spot if you paid close attention. See, remember when I said at the beginning of this section that Catherine becomes a saint? It's her journey through life and sainthood that highlights the main ethos of this entire video. Now, I won't be going into full detail on her life, because while it's a short one, with Catherine dying at age 33 after slowly losing her ability to eat and all mobility in her body, it's an impactful one. One that is well documented by heartfelt and often scathing letters to various high-ranking Catholic clergy members. Her most famous, of course, being the one she delivered in person, asking Pope Gregory to move the church from Avignon back to Rome. And he does. He listens. And while her impact on the Pope's decision has recently become up for debate, her impact as a whole is not. But it's one specific letter I find that she makes one of her most revealing statements. The letter is being sent to Raymond of Capua, her confessor, future biographer, and the second founder of the Dominicans, where Catherine advises him on how to survive in tough times. She writes, Do now what I did as a teenager. Build a cell inside your mind from which you can never flee. This sort of Truman Show-esque revelation left me reeling. Because if we must live in a prison, surely the best bet is one of our own design. There was Blair again, conceding to a life of bearing children for a man and a country who do not love her so that she does not have to live in a world where Chuck Bass is not alive. Conditioning yourself internally so that things suffered by flesh and blood seem easier to withstand. Which is, again, at its core, a basic practice of aestheticism. It's teenage Catherine that highlights the difference between the two. Okay, I'm not here to debate about religion. If you're Catholic and you wholeheartedly believe in her story, that's completely respectable and valid. But for the sake of the point, let's remove all possibility of the divine. On its face, Catherine's is a story of a young girl staring at the horizon of puberty with something akin to distaste and horror. Plagued with the knowledge she will someday be regulated to the same fate her sister is, she sets course on a life almost devoid of men. They're at one point joining, and excuse my butchering of this pronunciation, the Mantaletes, a group of religious women who serve the Virgin Mary. But it's a double-edged sword. In order for Catherine to maintain her freedom and importance, she must maintain her fast, must maintain her relationship with God. And it's this toxic combination of agency and piety that becomes so alluring to other young girls looking for a way to survive, or more importantly, circumvent the system, which catches us back up to Blair and her bargain for Chuck's life. Stuck with a man she does not love, regulated to a life of abuse and mistreatment, as it's frequently shown how cruel and cold the prince and his family can be, Blair has essentially forged herself a gilded abbey. Queens do not take lovers. That's for kings. And in Blair's world, a world where women are now free to choose, Giving up that ability seems hauntingly similar to creating a mental prison from which you cannot flee. Okay, but Blair had bulimia and Catherine had anorexia. So how were they the same? How were they linked? Well, let's finally go back and talk about the show. Specifically season one, episode nine, that Thanksgiving episode I mentioned in the beginning, aptly titled Blair Waldorf Must Pie. And this ultra 2010 episode, we see our young ingenue Blair come to tepid blows with her mother, Eleanor. The subject of their argument? Blair's father and his absence at their annual family dinner. What first appears on the surface as a subtle nod to disordered eating is at its core a masterpiece in female interpersonal relationships. Blair and her mother proceed to get into a heated argument amongst the guests, with Eleanor chastising Blair for not accepting the fact that her father has left them, to which Blair icily replies, he left you. But it's Eleanor's rebuttal that highlights what is so paramount to the link between all these stories. 
After instructing her daughter to finish her food, to which Blair replied, I'm not hungry, Eleanor goads her into selecting some dessert instead. Seems like an odd retort to the previous statement. She just said she wasn't hungry. That is, until we as the viewers find out that Blair's father's absence also means the absence of his famous pie. A or maybe dessert will change your mind. Where's daddy's pie? Hmm? A constant that Blair looks forward to every year. This revelation is soured further by Eleanor's somewhat delighted revelation that the pie was given to the doorman to make room for the sterile and significantly less sentimental catered desserts. Blair, seeming somewhere between defeated and defiant, exits the room with a huge blueberry pie in hand. Remember how I said it was a masterclass in female relationships? Look at the subtle nod that Dorota, the only plus size character who, interestingly enough, is not a part of the leisure class, gives to the other maids, signaling for them to leave Blair alone. After their exit, what proceeds can only be described as is. Blair eating the pie while a montage of moments where she perceives she fell short plays on the screen. Specifically scenes highlighting a nasty fight with her then boyfriend, the beloved Nate Archibald. In this moment, the centuries between Blair and Catherine seemed but a blip on the radar. Because if Blair lived in a world with more choice, it meant more ways to disappoint the patriarchy. More importantly, your father. It reminded me of a quote from Bunny Barstow's radical feminist therapy, working in the context of violence, which goes as follows. Often father and daughter look down on mother, woman, together. They exchange meaningful glances when she misses a point. They agree that she is not as bright as they are, cannot reason as they do. This collusion does not save the daughter from the mother's fate. Ouch, right? <laughs> Because however callous Eleanor's early statement may be, it precisely highlights the issue plaguing their relationship. In Blair's mind, Eleanor's failure to please her father is the reason behind his decisions to leave. And she proved so by earlier in the episode accusing her mother of telling her father that Blair did not want to see him. Although we as watchers know that divorce, which is quite common in American society, is never truly an excuse for a man to be absent from his child's life, although it's often peddled as one. And I believe it's this refusal to acknowledge any fault on her father that propels her later decision to save Chuck. You know that dreamy, all-American Nate Archibald cheats on her with her best friend. Chuck Bass does a plethora of unforgivable things, too horrifying to name, and Dan Humphrey is literally Gossip Girl. What does that mean? Well, if you ask me, Blair's dad and her ex-lovers seem quite similar to Catherine's vision of Jesus flanked by three apostles, detailing her way out. And Blair, who would get shipped off to an East Coast rehab faster than you could say Bergdorf Goodman, can't exactly declare a fast until the men around her listen, but she can punish herself when she fails to reach them. But that answer begged another question. When, and more importantly, why, did quote overeating unquote become a bad thing? Become something so shameful it manifests as a pseudo self voyeur, a self disciplinarian? The answer, of course, came from the past, one more recent than Catherine's. Talking about colonialism and the introduction of chattel slavery. Enter in Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. The book, while vast and important in its range of knowledge, highlights specifically the shift to Protonism, more specifically, in fact, the Enlightenment era, as the culprit. Talked about a lot, so walk with me here. If men view women as the inferior gender, one incapable of making their own choices and decisions, then they must be an example for them, right? But it's more than that. If women are to bear their children, are to raise them, they must not only think what the man wants them to think, they must believe it. They must find it to be the utter truth so they can enforce it. Much can be said about racism. I read this quote once in regards to schools being desegregated about how mothers were the first to push back. It said, if white men were the face of racism, white women were the head that turned the neck. They are the spotter the immediate reporter of all who step outside the pre-existing boundaries, the ones set for women. So, what did men do when slavery was introduced? When religion and piety were used to suppress and simultaneously appease their wives? When religion promoted and forgave their crimes against black women? They dehumanized us. 
set forth a smear campaign so vile the ancestors of its rhetoric still write the plays today. Black bodies became savage, immoral. Gone was the plump, soft-skinned maidens of the Renaissance, and laid before the women of that time was a blueprint on self-destruction. Because if fatness was a black thing, a savage thing, surely the opposite was domesticated, refined, safe from the type of gendered violence that chronically befell black women. The ones who worked as cooks, maids, nannies, wet nurses, the ones closest to the humanity of a white woman. Well, they had to be the first to be alienated. So that's what they did. Christ ordained suffering, just like Blair and Katharina. And Blair, born into an old money echo chamber kept afloat by white collar crime and infidelity, knows all too well the punishment for being fat. I mean, the only fat person we can see serves her. What does that message say? Look farther out at the cast, look at her friends. The body diversity or lack thereof in Gossip Girl almost seems intentional, if it weren't for the time period it came out in. Picture it. It's the Upper East Side in 2009, and nobody wants to be fat. Least of all, Blair Waldorf. And her constant inner cycle of self-soothing, self-loathing, and self-relief mimic that of a baptism by fire, forgiving yourself for your brushes with savagery. And it was here that I found myself at the end. Questions answered and points made, remembering a letter of Catherine's I read in my research. One where she details her shortcomings and failings as a human being, and specifically a child of God, despite being revered and beloved by almost all who met her. It was their dedication to fix, to apologize for things they hadn't broken. Blair and Katharina, both dutiful daughters making promises to their heavenly fathers. Equally who, on paper, end up with the life of freedom and esteem most women of their eras could only dream of. Yet, they teach us a crucial lesson. Their attempts at circumvention of societal standards come at a hefty cost. Because while a father god might allow a woman to win the battle, he birthed her losing the war. But, because this story is fiction, the ending is much happier than those of her peers. Unlike dear Catherine of Siena, our Blair did not succumb to her illness. Instead, she went on to live in the minds of the audiences, immortalized forever as the patron saint of Constant Billard School for Girls. But for the select few, like Little Jay or you watching this video, they see Blair for who she is, another brave Icarus with a deep desire for freedom and autonomy, who narrowly escaped bulimia's burning sun. Okay, you guys, that was the end of the video. I hope you like this type of content, something a little different for this channel, but the seriousness of these stories was one that I could not get out of my head. I hope you enjoyed this journey through history and science and feminism with me, and I hope that you learned something, and I hope that you'll teach me something too. I love reading the comments on my video, so please let me know any thoughts you had. I can't wait to read them, and you can always send me a message over on Instagram or TikTok. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'll see you all in my next video.